What's up, everybody? Welcome to the trailer park. My name is Jeff. I posted a video yesterday dealing with the rapture, kind of giving my this this rapture dream that I had, but also just to kind of clear the air that I don't hold that position any longer. But I love, listen, listen to me. I love, I love listening to people's rapture dreams or listening to people who has a different opinion in eschatology. I love it. I do, uh, for those that don't know, I do Bible rebinding for a living. So, uh, all day long I sit at my desk and I'm working with my hands uh, rebinding Bibles and so that's what I do I listen to stuff and a lot a, a great deal of what I listen to has to, to do with the prophetic has to do with eschatology um, and so I love it I just love listening to every view uh, pre-mill pre-mill dispensationalist on-mill post-mill uh, partial preterists like I just love listening to it um, does that make me weird hey whatever a lot of y'all are weird too but I love it and I want you to know that I do not uh, dislike people that disagree with me I listen to your channels I, I listen to what you what you have to say and, and listen if I say something that that you disagree with and, 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 you, and you comment I'm probably not going to comment back on your comment but, but if, if you say something that I think is relevant I'll do a video on it so if you can if I say something and you say something or, or send me a link to something that that's good that I think is good, I'll reply to it. I'll do a video responding to it. So, with that being said, this coming Lord's Day, because uh, I'm a pastor at a Reformed Baptist Church, Covenant Reformed Baptist Church in Tallahoma, Tennessee, this coming Lord's Day, I'm going to be teaching. And, uh, so I'm preaching through the book of Hebrews right now, but I've just come to a point where I have to go and lay some groundwork. And to lay the groundwork, we're going to have to look at Matthew 24, dealing with what most people would call the fig tree generation. But even beyond that, we're going to have to look at the, the, the uh, Daniel. And so this week I'm going to be taking a, a, a dive into Daniel chapter 9 and I hope that y'all link to my church website or my church website or my church YouTube channel like it and listen to this sermon that I'm going to be preaching and I'm going to be walking through for the next few weeks could be longer I don't know but I want to give a heads up kind of like a little uh uh which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit this coming Lord's Day, but Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 2. Listen, if you ain't got your tinfoil hats on, get them on. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is, is it's, it's really the chapter when it comes to eschatology and when it comes to uh, what, what you hold uh, on a uh, on end times, such as, you know, are you a pre-mill, are you an all-mill, or are you a post-mill? So Daniel chapter 2 is going to be vital to where you stand on the millennium. So I don't have a Bible in front of me, as you can see. I'm, I'm, I'm in my vehicle. I'm driving to my son's preschool to pick him up. I just got done working all day, so I, I'm not going to be able to to read off text to you. I, I don't really have a lot of time to do videos, so I have to get in where I fit in. But in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in this 
dream that he has, he's looking for someone that can tell him what it is that he dreamed. He says, if no one can tell me my dream, guess what? I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill all the wise men. All the people that think they know something, I'm killing them. He said, not only are you to tell me what I dream, but you are to give me the interpretation of the dream. So, he sends out the decree. He's about to kill everybody. Daniel finds out what's going on. He asks permission to, to uh, pray with, his, uh, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to figure out the dream. To ask God to give them an interpretation. So God grants them the interpretation. And he comes to King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, giving all glory to God that, 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 that him as a man, is, he is not able to reveal to the king what he has dreamed. But there's a God in heaven who, who can and has. And he's given the, the dream and the interpretation to Daniel to give to him. So he tells them that in his dream, he had a dream of an image. And this image was, uh, you know, uh, the head of the image was gold. The, uh, the chest and thigh, I mean, the, the chest and arms, excuse me, the chest and arms were were, uh, were silver. The thighs were bronze, and its legs of iron, and its feet of iron mingled with clay. And he tells him that, that, the, the, that he... Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Now that's vitally important because we know that not only does the head of gold represent Nebuchadnezzar, but it represents his kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. So the head of gold represents both Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. That's going to be key. Okay? Well, and after this kingdom, the head of God, would come one that would overthrow his kingdom. And this would be the Medes and the Persians. That would be the, the, the chest and arms of silver. And then you have, I have the dates written down, but I don't have them in my head, so forgive me. Hallelujah. And then there's the, uh, the thighs of bronze, which represents Grisha, uh, Greece. They, they overthrew Medes and Persians. But then the, 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 the fourth kingdom is the legs of iron and this fourth kingdom represents Rome. Now whenever you get into the the, uh, the eschatology discussion, this is where you want to put on some boxing gloves and try to knock each other out. Because where the the, the uh, where the ankles are and the ankles and the feet meet where the uh, you have the iron the legs of iron but then the feet are partly iron and partly clay the dispensationals will will put a gap right there so they'll say yes there's no time gap in between the head of gold the chest of silver the thighs of bronze and the legs of iron. But there is a time gap between the feet of iron mingled with clay. And right now this time gap uh, is a 2,000 year gap so far, or greater than 2,000 years. You know, 2,400 and something years. And so this gap will also feeds into Daniel chapter 9, which will be dealing with this Lord's Day at my church. Because in Daniel chapter 9, there's a, a gap which uh, all prophecy, all, all students of prophecy will know as the 70 weeks of Daniel. They believe at the 69th week, there's a gap and that we have not, uh, that we are not in the 70th week of Daniel. Well, so if the iron, if the iron, so the feet of this statue is partly iron, partly clay. So the partly iron has to be the same iron that's with the legs. So this iron that's in the feet 
is the same iron that's in the legs. Are you following me? Do I need to slow it down? Okay, so that means that the in the feet, the part that is partly iron is roan. Okay, now I'm taking the view that there is no gap. That there is no gap. Now the question is, is what is the clay? What is the clay? If the iron is Rome, then what is the clay that it is mixed with? Well, I think scripture clearly answers this question. Scripture clearly answers this question. How? Jeremiah, Isaiah, even in Romans chapter 9, the, the dreaded chapter, right? For people to deal with expositionally. It's clear. Pointing to God, you are the potter. Yahweh, God, you are the potter. The Jews. We are the clay. There's only... So I believe the clay is a representation of Israel, Jerusalem, the Jews. And there's only one moment in time, one period of time where iron was mingled with clay. And this was during the, uh, the Roman peace. This was during the time whenever... Uh, the first century Jerusalem. Now notice the next part of this story of the statue. It says that there was a stone that's carved out by no human hand. And it comes down and it hits the statue on the feet of iron mingled with clay. Are you following me? That this stone that's carved out by no human hands comes down and hits the statue part of the statue where the iron is mingled with clay. Jesus Christ had no earthly father. Born of a virgin, the, the Holy Spirit uh, came upon Mary, hovered over her. She was conceived and bore a son. The stone was carved out by no human hands. Jesus Christ is the stumbling stone that the builders rejected. He uh, the, the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the stone. But just like Nebuchadnezzar was a, a representation of the goad, but also the kingdom was a representation of the goad. This stone that came in the time when iron was mingled with clay, first century of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ came, was incarnated, uh, the, the hypostatic union, the incarnation during the time where the iron was mingled with clay. And this stone is not only a representation of Jesus Christ, but it is the foundation of the church, the kingdom of God. And it says, like if you keep reading this chapter, please do. It says that this stone rose into a mountain and it covers the whole earth. And it goes on to say that this kingdom will never end. So this stone carved out by no human hands hits the statue. This would have been first century Jerusalem. I believe it would have been about 3 B.C. It hits the statue, and that stone, when it hits the earth, hits the statue, it grows on the earth as a mountain that covers the whole earth. Now, this is where the, the uh, millennial comes in. Because if you believe in a future millennial of Jesus reigning on the earth for 1,000 years, then that stone has not yet touched the earth. That stone has not yet entered and smite the statue on the feet and has grown into a mountain that covers the whole earth. 
if you're an all male, that stone that grows into a kingdom, that, that, that grows and covers the whole earth, is never on the earth. It's in heaven. All males believe that the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of Jesus Christ in heaven and not on earth. Only post-millennialism teaches that the, Jesus being the stone and that stone being the kingdom of God comes hangs on the earth and that stone, the kingdom of God, grows on the earth as a great mountain that covers the whole earth. That as the waters cover the sea, so shall the knowledge of the Lord. Now I'm not saying that right now as we speak that this mountain covers the whole earth. But this mountain is a lot bigger than it was in first century Jerusalem. That's what I'm saying. That's what this guy's saying. So, like, it just comes to a point where you have to look at this chapter. There is no gaps. There is no separation. The iron in the feet is the same iron that's in the legs. It's Rome. And the clay is Jerusalem. There's only one moment of time where iron and clay were mixed together that was in first century Jerusalem. First century, during the Roman peace. And that's when the, uh, that stone was cut out by no human hands, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And he came into the world. And that stone not only represents Christ Jesus, but it represents his kingdom. His kingdom has come. He was given a kingdom by his father. And that kingdom, every time the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. And if God sovereignly chooses to open a heart to receive this message, they are a sprig that's added to the temple of God. They are added to the kingdom. Brick by brick by brick, this temple, this mountain is going to cover the whole earth. And what you have to do if you're a Christian is to preach the gospel. Witness. Be a witness for Jesus Christ. And if you're listening to this and you're not a, a Christian, know this. You, you're you not a sin. I mean, I mean, you don't sin because you're a sinner. I'm, I'm not excuse me. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Are you hearing me? You have you you the you have never lived a moment of your life where you have been obedient to God. You do you've never loved God the way Scripture commands you to. You do not love your neighbor. You, you, I mean, you, you don't. If you envy him, if you look at, if I'm speaking to like, well, well, let's say you're a man and your neighbor has a wife or your friend has a wife and you lustfully think about her, you're not loving your neighbor. I don't care how many outward good deeds you do for him. Like, like, like we are sinfully sinful. We are corrupt. Our nature is corrupt. There's nothing we can do to get to God. The only way that anyone can be saved would be the same way that Abraham was saved. Uh, uh, God took Abraham away from his people. He takes him out into a dark lit de a, a, a desert in the night sky and, and stars everywhere. And he tells him that, uh, that an offspring was going to come from him and that this offspring that's going to come from him is going to, 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 to bless the nations. And he tells them that, that as many stars are in the sky, so shall his offspring be. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God. He believed that so shall his offspring be when it comes to the number of the stars that was according to the offspring that would come from him. He believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. God credited it to him as righteousness. You and I we have to understand this. That the only way that you and I can go to that can be right with God is because 
of the active obedience of Jesus Christ. The active obedience of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived a life that we could not live. He loved God perfectly. He loved his neighbors perfectly. And he died the death that you and I deserve to die. You and I do not love God perfectly. You and I do not love our neighbors perfectly. Jesus Christ had, did. Jesus Christ stood in our stead that when he was on the cross, the wrath of God and the mercy of God met for the first time. The wrath of God that you and I deserve fell on Jesus and the mercy of God that you and I do not deserve comes to us through the act of obedience of Christ. Because of the act of obedience of Christ, if we believe God, if we believe in Jesus Christ, what God has done to rescue us through Christ Jesus, you and I can stand before God perfectly righteous because of the act of obedience of God. God will credit to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when we stand before him, it will be as if we have never sinned. Not because we have never sinned, we're sinful, but because of the act of obedience of Christ. You and I have always been actively disobedient. Not obedient, actively disobedient. The only way that anyone can be saved is through the act of obedience of Christ. We believe what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And by doing so, he credited his act of obedience to our account. Okay? So I beg you to repent and believe the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a different view on eschatology, please keep making videos and I'll keep listening to them. Hallelujah, holla back.